just from Pat, so Pat's not going to be with us. Any other apologies? Um, Gemma has indicated she'll be late on this delegated vote to Melissa. You got, you got her, Gemma's vote. Yeah, uh, Chair, uh, <coughs> I'm going to have to go out at the times too, just at the Yeah, I think we're all in that. Yeah. We'll do that as well. Uh, but you haven't heard anything from Philip? Alicia. Yeah, Philip, Philip uh, will be joining. Hi, Gemma. Thanks. Uh, oh, what was the line? Uh, members, are we any? Philip will join, I think. Um, probably in Starleaf, is it? Not there yet. Okay, I'll just take okay. it. Okay, we'll keep an eye on it. Okay, thank you. Any declarations of interest? Nope. Thank you. Uh, move on now. And uh, first part of the item on the agenda Institute of Revenue Ratings and Valuations. Can I bring on uh, David, please, on Starleaf? Hi, David. Can you hear us okay? I can hear you very clearly, yes. Good. Okay. Uh, team, we're now about to receive oral evidence from David Moger, OBE, Chief Executive of the Institute of Revenue Ratings and Valuations on the Non-Domestic Rates Valuation Coronavirus Bill. Uh, the session will be recorded by Hansard. Uh, David, you're very welcome to the Committee for Finance. Uh, we have invited you to the meeting in order to hear your views on the Non-Domestic Rates Valuation Coronavirus Bill. The bill will remove largely anything which relates to the pandemic as the basis of appeals in respect of business rates valuations, and this will be backdated to the 1st of April 2020. Uh, please could you take about uh, the next 10 minutes or so to tell us what you like or dislike about the bill, and perhaps you could tell us how you would like to see it amended, if at all. And could you update us on how the legislation is going through in uh, England and Westminster at the moment first, if you could, please? <coughs> Yes, the, the, the situation arose in England as a result of um, the, a, a press release issued by one of the firms of rating agents. Basically, the, uh, the, the appeal process in England is different to that in, in Northern Ireland. It's, on, it's a three-stage a three stage process of check, challenge and appeal. And a number of ratepayers had put the challenges in against uh, their values uh, as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. And these were done under the rules that enabled uh, coronavirus to be regarded as a material change of circumstance. These, uh, th 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 these particular appeals had, had been placed uh, before the Valuation Office Agency and negotiations were taking place between the Valuation Office Agency uh, and, and the individual ratepayers and their agents. And whilst this process was underway, um, one of the agents issued a press release to say that they had secured a significant reduction on behalf of their clients and that their clients would be, um, would be getting a significant refund and the figure that was quoted was in hundreds of millions of pounds. Uh, this immediately caused concern uh, right across government and as a result of this, um, the government very quickly uh, put in place uh, a, a, re a revision to the regulations that would immediately stop uh, any further challenges on value because of the coronavirus um, back at pandemic. Uh, this, this particular regulation passed very quickly and became law. So anything from that particular date, which was a date uh, around about in, in uh, early summer of uh, 2020, but of course, there was then the, the, the problem of, 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 uh, of retrospection. And this, this then became a major issue because obviously you had to take the issue back to when the pandemic started. Uh, but the, the, the regulation itself didn't allow, allow for retrospection. So the bill has been passing through Parliament. Um, it's now, it, it, it actually went to the Lords. It didn't come back to the Commons purely and simply be, because the uh, be, 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 because the, the, there were no amendments in the Lords, so it's gone straight to the to the to the Queen for for, for the royal assent. Whilst all this the process has been going on, the, the government announced that they would create a fund of 1.5 billion pounds, and that would be a, a, a coronavirus relief sum, and that would be paid to those people that had suffered or their businesses had suffered as a result of the coronavirus and the consequences of the pandemic. Now that the bill has uh, gone to the Royal Assent, as, as soon as it's given the Royal Assent, the government will be issuing guidance on the distribution of the £1.5 billion. Um, the, the effect of the bill becoming an act will, will, will then prevent any retrospection of the original regulation. The problem that's going to, is facing local government now in England is that it's how the £1.5 is going to be distributed. 
because the expectations of the ratepayers have been raised by the fact that they had made the appeals and that some agents had made progress with the valuation officer in securing reductions. But of course, those reductions now won't happen. But unfortunately, there's a disconnect between... Sorry, sorry the, David, just a, just a quick one there. So even though the reductions had been agreed because of this bill going through and its retrospective aspect of it, those reductions are no longer are not going to take place. So it will be at the original rating value. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry, sorry for interrupting. Yep. So, 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 so basically, the the 1.5 billion is going to be distributed on the basis of the success of the individual business and the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on the business. So they won't be taken account at all of the fact that they may or may not have appealed against uh, against the uh, uh, using the material change of circumstance uh, a power. So they now find themselves in a situation where we, we await the, uh, the originally the, the, the initial distribution of the 1.5 billion to the 314 individual billing authorities in England. And then of course, each individual billing authority will have to distribute that sum to, uh, to, to individual ratepayers, and that will be based on guidance given by government, and that guidance has yet to arrive. So, in England now, we are in a, it's a waiting game, but with, with, with considerable uncertainty. And as I say, with, with expectations of certain ratepayers raised, but those expectations I don't think are going to be met because the criteria for giving out the 1.5 billion is different. So that's the, that's the situation currently in England. We're, we're, we're awaiting the, the, final, the final stages. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Um, so just a couple of questions uh, to ask you there, David. Uh, one of the first ones, um, one of the problems we have with the legislation that's been brought forward in, or is likely to be brought forward in Northern Ireland is the catch-all uh, language around it, and it doesn't just refer to COVID as the, uh, as the event. It also says to COVID or subsequent, I think, what's the language? Subsequent? Other, other pandemics, I think. Other pandemics. Is that the same language being used in the English legislation, or has it just been purely focused around COVID? No, it's, it's catch-all legislation as well, because obviously this, this situation is, is so unique and what, what the legislation is attempting to do is to prevent it from happening again. So, so the, 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 they have specified exactly how, um, you know, how, how, the, how the, the provisions can be used in the future. But of course, the, the, the problem with this is, that, is the underlying issue around the financing of local government. The, the valuation process is, is basically a distribution mechanism to determine how, how the business rates that's collected is, is distributed to each individual local authority. And, and that's where the problem is. So when you have reductions created by a situation like the pandemic, it forces the chief financial officers of the individual local authorities to actually make provisions for any money that they may uh, that they may lose as a result of the reductions in value, it will remove that risk now, and that's why the legislation in England has got a, a, it. Really, is a catch-all provision. Okay. Okay. Dogs. Jim. Yeah, I take it there's no dispute that the assessment of the rateable value would, in the normal course of events, be affected by a matter such as COVID, and the purpose of this legislation is to circumvent that on the basis that businesses had got financial assistance. Is, is that the reasoning of it? That, that's, that, that, has been, that has been mentioned in the uh, statements coming from, uh, fr fr from government, but of course, until we get the guidance, we don't know if that's going to be the situation. But there has been comment made that those that have been in receipt of relief, for example, the, the retail hospitality and leisure relief, or had received payments from the government through the various schemes, that would not that they would not be entitled to the relief. But at the moment, uh, that's nothing more than ministerial comments uh, that have been made in committee and that have been made in various um, in various circulars coming out from government. It won't be until you see the actual. Um, guidance, and you find out exactly what that guidance says. But of course, this this particular 1.5 billion is being distributed to local authorities via a mechanism which, under the localism legislation, which means that we use a particular part of the legislation, uh, which gives the local authority unfettered discretion to distribute the money as it sees fit. Mm -hmm. 
but of course it has to have regard to government guidance so that's why the guidance is so critical but the comment you make is absolutely correct would another possible approach not to have been to say that at any appeal against evaluation because of the COVID impact that there would be the amount of money received in assistance that that would be measured and evaluated in the appeal to offset the losses uh, resulting from COVID? Is that not the other way of doing this registration? There, 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 is, there, is a, there is a different approach. I mean, by, by just the, the slight difference between England and Northern Ireland. In England, you have the rate poundage or the multiplier set nationally, yeah. and, and that yeah. is distributed by government through, through, a, through a rate retention scheme where, where some, a proportion of the money is retained by local government and the other purport, the balance is distributed to local government. So that, distribu that distribution mechanism could have been utilised to, uh, to, to compensate the individual local authorities for the loss. Uh, if, it, if they'd taken that approach, of course, you, wouldn't, you would have then had values that would have reflected the current relationship between, between the, the, the landlord and the tenant, because that's basically what, how the valuation process is determined. And you, you, you could have avoided uh, the, the, the distribution of the, distribution of the relief. Uh, and, and you would have compensated local authorities. In Northern Ireland, it's a, it's a slightly different situation because if this legislation were, were not to pass, and the, let's say in the, in, the current, in the current financial year, and it went to, over to, to next year, at the moment, directors of finance in the, in the 11 local authorities in Northern Ireland are preparing their budgets and they're calculating their penny rate products uh, for, for, for next year. And in calculating those penny rate products, they have to have regard to the income they're likely to get next year. Now, if they are aware that there's a possibility of a reduction in assessment, they have to include that in their calculations and they have to make provision for it so that the amount of revenue that they collect is sufficient. Now, the impact of that would be, of course, to lift the rate poundage. No, well, my point's a different point. And you've seen our draft legislation, I take it? Yes, I have. Instead of saying that in, in, sub, in clause one, sub clause one, that the matters mentioned in paragraph one A of that article, that's article 39A of the rates order, yeah. are to be treated as not including and never having included any matter directly or indirectly attributable to coronavirus. Instead of saying that, if you had permitted the appeals but said that in respect of such appeals, uh, matters mentioned in paragraph 1A of that article are to be measured and evaluated having regard to any financial assistance obtained arising from the COVID uh, assistance packages. Could you not have still kept the NAVs informed by that and arrived at a more equitable outcome? You, 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 you would have you would have maintained the integrity of the valuation list because the valuation list would be reflecting the the, the current situation. The important thing is, is that listening to carefully to what you just said, that would be a mechanism whereby the local authorities would be reimbursed the money. I think that's the that's the absolute key, is because if you if you reduce the values, that re that means that each of the individual rate payers would, 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 would get a refund. That would be money that would be taken away from the exchequer of the individual local authority. And the only way they can recover that money is either by support from, from, from the assembly or by borrowing the money or using their balances and then adjusting their poundage for the following year. So it, it, providing the chief financial officer has got the opportunity to make the adjustment uh, in their rate product for next year, that would be that would certainly be a workable situation. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Matthew. Thank you, and thank you for coming to give us um, uh, evidence today. Um, can I just ask, uh, in relation to the um, the bill that's going through Westminster at the minute, um, does your uh, organ? You've just uh, answered a question in relation to. A, a potential hypothetical alternative to a bill here, but what is your institute's view of any potential alternatives? Did, did, were, were you broadly content with the uh, 
approach taken by the UK government, or did, would you have preferred an alternative route? No, I think we, we, we were broadly content because we, we see that the pandemic and this type of crisis as, as one-off situations and, and obviously one hopes that it, it won't happen again, but you just need to be able to cater for this. And one of the advantages of using the property tax is that it's relatively stable. But the pandemic has, has proved that that stability isn't as certain as we, we thought it was. And I think the general feeling is that this was a, this was a reasonable way forward and that uh, the, 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 uh, the other assistance, the other financial assistance given by government, the direct assistance, was a better way of achieving the objectives rather than uh, disturbing the integrity of the valuation list. Okay. And when it comes to disturbing the integrity of the, of the valuation list, um, uh, it, it, would it, it, w surely a, a potential challenge to that would be that the scale of the pandemic um, is such that the valuation list is by the scale of the pandemic has, and its effect on <coughs> people's ability to transact business, particularly certain types of business with physical premises, hospitality, certain types of retail, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, um, that those that the in a sense there have been such a big hit that the rating list is in itself um, redundant anyway. That would be a, a, a counter a, a potential counter argument. What, what would you say to that? Yeah, that, 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 that's that's correct. And the the the, the list, the, the real the real problem here is is that there is, since time immemorial, the the rating system has had an appeal process, and that appeal process has triggered the 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 the. the uh, the cumulative rateable value for a, for, a, for a local authority area, whether it be in Scotland, Northern Ireland, or England or Wales, and and what you what, what you see is the reduction in the value and an increase in the poundage. At least then, your rateable values for the individual properties would be reflecting the market, and basically that's what the problem, that's what the rating system is. It's a it's a it's a system that creates a distribution mechanism that's based on on rental values or yeah. substituted valuation methods for rented rental values, and and that that's the basis of the system. Um, and if you get a situation like the pandemic, where there is a severe loss of income as a result of one circumstance, you have to decide which way you're going to deal with it. You're either going to let let the List take take the hit, and so the rateable values go down, and the poundage or the multiplier increases. Or the government will support the individual ratepayers directly with relief, such as RHR relief. Okay, yeah. that's helpful. Okay, thanks, Matthew. Anything else, sir? Keith. Yeah, just just one question, David. Thank you for the information so far. Just re you refer to the guidance on the 1.5 billion. Does that gu guidance have any implementation here at all? Or is it purely devolved? If there's a 50 million, which I understand the figure to be, does that gain have any reflection here? Well, it, it would depend on, on the decisions of, of yourselves, basically, because the the uh, the 1.5 billion that's been announced by the Treasury for England and, and to a lesser extent for Wales is is an amount of money that, that we know is going to be distributed in lieu of the removal of the material change of circumstance appeals. So therefore, the ratepayers will be getting that money. The government have outlined how they want it distributed. Now, that's the choice of the government based on the various reliefs that have been paid out in England. I think as far as Northern Ireland is concerned, you've had similar reliefs. And in many respects, those reliefs have, have, been, have been more generous. Now, that, that 50 million, I assume that will come to you as a Barnet consequential, and that would be you would have the discretion to spend that money how, how you wish. Now, if that money was used to support ratepayers, it would be for you to decide at some time in the future how that best would support would support the individual ratepayers. It could either be distributed individually to those who are expecting to get some form of relief, or it could be just paid to every ratepayer as, a, as, a, as a, an extension of whatever reliefs you may be giving next year. I, I think you've got, you've got the flexibility to spend that as you wish. I, I, wouldn't, um, I, I wouldn't have thought the guidance issued by the, uh, the, by, by the Parliament for England would, would in any way influence your decisions, because it's dealing with the particular circumstances in England and the way the rating appeal process has worked in England. And you know the reality is that, you know, for example, an RHL case has hardly paid any rates for the last two years. Um, you could hardly give them a significant amount of relief if they haven't paid any rates. So it, it's 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 a really it's a very difficult uh, very difficult balls to juggle in the air. I'm afraid. Okay. Thanks, David. Thanks. David, just a quick one. The 1.5 billion 
Now, that's obviously going to be uh, that's going to be made available when the bill gets royal assent and goes out. Do they have to spend that by the end of the financial <coughs> year? No, it's 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 an it's an amount of money that will be distributed. I think the way things are looking at the moment, um, because the discretion is going to be uh, absolute to the local authority to make its own mind up to ensure that you distribute the amount fairly. I would have thought you'd have to receive applications to those who feel they're entitled to some relief before you actually start distributing the money. Otherwise, you'll run out. But the, even if the guidance came towards the end of this week before Parliament raised on the 16th of December, I think the chances of local authorities putting a scheme in place, making the decision as to whether it was delegated to officers or whether it was the elected members that actually made the decisions on the relief, to have that relief in place uh, during the current financial year would be would be a very very difficult task. I'm sure local authorities will try to achieve that, but no, the money can be. Uh, I, I suspect it, the majority of it will be allowed against next year's rate liability. Okay, because we've, we've been, <laughs> yeah, we've been briefed by one of the urgencies of getting our legislation through is that if we don't do it by the time we get to the end of the financial year, because the money, the 50 million pounds that's due to come across as a Barnet consequential has to be spent uh, before the end of the financial year. But that's not the situation as you see it in England and Wales. No, but remember the, prob the problem in Northern Ireland is that if your legislation doesn't go through um, before the end of this current financial year, the chief financial officers of the 11 local authorities are going to have to look at their calculations with regard to their rate poundages because they need to make provision for any loss of income. You know, if the legislation was for some reason to fall and they hadn't made sufficient uh, sufficient adjustments uh, for the loss of income in calculating the rate product and consequently the rate poundage, uh, they would not have sufficient money to run the services for next year and they would have to turn to you, no doubt, for, for the extra financial support or use their balances. Okay. Thanks. And just to run a final one, again, going back to the uh, business about sort of COVID and or other infections, does the, just for clarity, does the Westminster Bill mention any other infections? Is it just COVID or similar, something similar? It's, it's yeah, just COVID related. It doesn't, it doesn't broaden it in any way. And have you picked up any conversations there might be about as well about issues or things being developed about avian flu and some of the other the other pandemics that are sitting out there? No, that's not been that's not been discussed at all. I think the intent, the hope is that the the, the adjustment in the material change of circumstance regulations uh, will be sufficient to actually you know meet any future pandemic situations okay thank you any other uh, any other comments Sorry. jim jim oh the jim okay david thank you very much indeed for your time and thank you very much indeed for sort of making yourself available at short notice to uh, talk to the committee thank you thank you goodbye okay cheers and we take uh, david off spotlight uh, next item is uh, we're inviting Ian, Sharon, and Angela to come in. On this, or just come in? Best of the bring. Come on, on, in, Ian. Is Angela going to sneak in the back? Yes, I should say. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for coming in. Uh, team, we're now going to receive oral evidence from the Department of Finance on the non domestic rates valuation coronavirus bill. Again, the session will be reported by Hansard. Uh, it's, it, it seems like welcome, but welcome to old friends and welcome back into the, uh, into the Senate chamber here. Uh, Ian, Chief Executive, as we know, Sharon is Director of Rating Policy, and Angela is the Assistant Secretary of the Valuation Headquarters. Uh, the relevant papers are as follows. Clark's notice at page 12, the Committee's most recent correspondence at page 20, and the responses in the table items. Departmental submission, including the summary of legal advices at page 31. The Fiscal Council responses at page 48, and the ESR's advices at page 58. Uh, you're, Ian and team, you're very welcome to the Committee for Finance. Ian, who's going to speak? Are you going to give us your opening statement, and then we'll ask you a few questions? Well, Chair, I thought since we'd been here already, and there's been quite a lot of correspondence with the committee, we'll just do a minute. That was an introduction, and then yeah, the members take the questions. Um, 
This is the, the formal introduction from the Department of the uh, Non-Domestic Rates Valuations Coronavirus Bill. The um, bill consists of one substantive clause, which has been carefully <coughs> framed to mitigate any associated loss that might occur from the, or to the overall net annual value from the non-domestic valuation list within the rating system as a result of public health measures implemented, I'm sorry, um, implemented by the executive from the 20th of March 2020, or any future pandemic that may necessitate similar kinds of measures. Um, so essentially, um, the purpose of the bill is to stop the erosion of the tax base um, from any COVID-related challenges which might come in with pairs. Okay. Um, I'm just going to fire off a couple of questions so we get through. Okay. Uh, the bill includes delegated powers. The committee previously m misunderstood this to mean that the provisions of the bill will continue to apply in the event of a change to the naming convention of the current pandemic only. However, it appears that the intention of the power is different. In your written response and in the long title, it appears that the intention is to allow these provisions to apply to any other pandemic. Is that the case? And can the department explain the intention of the delegated power? Um, yeah, it is the case that um, what we've attempted to do here, this is, a, of course, an unprecedented event, the, the pandemic. Um, and uh, a number of emergency measures have had to be put in place, and we've had to try to work out what the implications of the pandemic are on, on various aspects of public administration, the rating system being quite complex is one of the ones that's been quite difficult to work through. Um, but having gone through the process and there having been a pandemic which required closure of business premises, um, then what we're attempting to do is future-proof the bill in such a way that if there's another pandemic at some point in the future, um, then the, a similar kind of uh, problem wouldn't reoccur in the valuation list. Um, the idea behind the, the delegated power then in the event that such a thing was to happen um, and it was a different pandemic or there was a mutation of the coronavirus in such a way that became called something different, then the Assembly could enact the power uh, to, to set aside that from the um, assessment of appeals in the valuation list um, by use of a, an affirmative procedure, so secondary legislation using the affirmative procedure. So let's say you know, we're going through an avian flu I'm not going to use the word pandemic at the moment, but there has been a significant outbreak that may lead to it. So it's obviously going to affect considerably sort of our poultry businesses and the rest of it. So technically speaking, we could use this legislation then to deal with avian flu as well. Um, if you had a situation where there was widespread problems in the business sector which required those businesses to shut down effectively. Um, so the, the matters, and you have to relate this back to the matters in Article 39A, 1A of the rates order, which are those matters which affect the physical enjoyment of the of the yeah. property, or which affect other properties in the vicinity, and therefore have an impact on on, on your business. Um, so if you had a situation where you had another pandemic which was causing those kinds of problems, and those kinds of problems were widespread and would become unaffordable, then yes, you would move to that. Now, I would point out to the committee that we have had a foot and mouth epidemic and we have had avian flu in the past 20 years. Neither one of those necessitated any kind of measure of this nature um, because there weren't widespread business closures as a consequence yeah. of those pandemics. But if you had, heaven forbid, a smallpox epidemic or any kind of other very serious um, human um, disease infection type of pandemic that would require a whole lot of measures to be put in place to control the spread of that, which would include things like the closure of businesses, then this is the kind of scenario that you would expect to see these, these powers enacted again. Okay. Um, other advice to the committee suggests that the current incorrect wording of the delegated power could actually prevent the provision of the bill being applied in the event of a change to the naming convention of the current pandemic, i.e. they decided to call it something else. Will the department bring forward an amendment to address this error? Well, we, we don't agree that there has been an error. So if you look at Article or Section 1, Part 5, um, where it defines the coronavirus, um, so the, the way that you would deal with that would be bring forward an amendment which would change the definition of coronavirus in the legislation. Now, we're happy to take legal advice again just to make sure that is correct, but that's our... And that says coronavirus means severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, SARS-CoV-2. Yeah. That is the... Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Jim. Yeah. Um, the effect of this legislation, I think, indisputably, will mean that an NAV, because it's not taking account of the adverse impact of COVID, will 
be out of kilter with the market. Is that fair? Um, well, yes. Yes. Which of itself is quite a major and revolutionary step to take in respect of rating. Um, well, um, in that the basic premise of rates is they should be a reflection of the rental value. At a, at a date, which is the antecedent date. valuation date. Yeah. So I think, as, as we explained um, at the previous briefing to the committee, if there are economic shifts in the property market between valuation dates, then you will have, during that period of time, some rental values which will be out of kilter with the market, to use the, yeah. the phrase that yeah. you used. Um, so those are dealt with at a revaluation. So we have already set in train um, the next revaluation, which will take effect from Except the 1st of April 2023. On the wording of 1 1, this applies for all time mm -hmm. to all subsequent NAVs. You can never have a COVID impact on a future NAV. No, you couldn't. Yeah. That's the point. Oh, See, is sorry. another way of doing it. Sorry, could, could I maybe yes. step in there? Um, just to correct, Chair, my, my title is Commissioner of Valuation for Northern Ireland, not Assistant Secretary. So. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, it's not correct to say that, uh, that there will never be any potential um, reflection of COVID-19 in uh, the valuations that are, that are put into the valuation list. The correct point in time at which the valuations are um, the market, the temperature of the market values are um, taken is at uh, at a revaluation and at the antecedent valuation date for that revaluation. So, where we are at this point in time in going out to the reval 2023, we are taking the temperature of the market as it is now at October 2021, informed by reflecting COVID. reflecting any impact on the rents that have taken that, that that COVID has had on the rental values in the market at this point in time. Then explain to me the third line of clause 1 1. For the purposes of the application of Article 39A of the rates order to the net annual value list that came into force on the 1st of April 2020 and to each subsequent net annual value list, the matters mentioned, etc. So the, the, the amendment that is being brought in or the legislative that has been brought in is in relation to Article 39A. Yes. So 39A only uh, impacts when a new valuation list is published. At, at every other revaluation, it is the market value and the rental values at the antecedent valuation date. 39A kicks in where there is a, a difference, a change, a physical impacts that have um, <coughs> potentially come in at the date of publication of the new list. And it is at that stage that any any difference between the antecedent valuation date economic circumstances of a revaluation um, and the date of publication would be taken into account at that stage and would be ruled out at that stage. So, so what is the meaning of the words and to each subsequent NAV list? So for any so for twenty twenty three, if we, we are taking the temperature of the market at first of October twenty twenty one. Yes. Mm -hmm. For example, if, for example, something uh, occurs on the date of publication, or the effective date of the valuation list on the first of April, twenty twenty-three, similar to what happened in twenty twenty, so there are lots of uh, le re legislation there or restrictions there that prevent the the use and occupation of premises at that point in time, which weren't in place uh, at the time of um, the antecedent valuation date. At that point. Um, that would that would kick in, to See, so well, so well, in effect the the situation could happen again, yeah. Um, on publication of reval 2023 or reval 2026, if there are continual uh, changes to the the health health protection coronavirus um, regulations was that, was that at not the, the point, point you in time when the valuation list. Sorry, was that not the point you contradicted me on that this legislation has drafted? would in fact inform future valuations in respect of COVID. You said no, no, no. Um, I think I may have misunderstood your question whenever I answered you, first of all, Mr. Alistair. So yes, I think, you gave me a different answer. Yes, I did. So the, 
uh, go back to, if you remember, on the 3rd of November when I was here, and Mr O'Toole asked me a question, I think somebody else asked me the similar kind of question. What we are doing with this legislation is making COVID an economic effect, and economic effects get taken into account in the valuation list at revaluations. Mm -hmm. um, so the economic effect of COVID will most certainly be taken into account at the uh, next revaluation take effect in uh, April 2023 and probably again in 2026 whenever the, the subsequent one is done. So the economic impacts of COVID will most definitely be taken into account in the valuation list. What we're attempting to do here is take away the possibility that an event like a pandemic or a reoccurrence of COVID or another wave of COVID um, as in fact, if we have more lockdown because of Omicron, for example, mm -hmm. which will take effect between the antecedent valuation date and the publication, which affects an individual business or a number of businesses, won't then be used as a way of ch challenging the valuations that we're taking account of in the, with the economic effects. So separating the two things, this legislation is very specifically about the physical restrictions which take place on the business, that inability of you to enjoy the physical enjoyment of your hair mm -hmm. and actually treating COVID as an economic impact, which will take place over the longer term. I hope that well, I'm going to ask you then, yeah. what's the meaning of the words and to each subsequent NAV list? Um, in respect of the articles listed in Article 39A, 1A, then those cannot be taken into account. That's in the physical it. enjoyment. Yes. Mm -hmm. If articles. an event happens between the antecedent valuation date and the date of publication. If a COVID event occurs? Yes, a COVID event. So, as or I said, anything related to COVID? Yes. So if we have, heaven forbid, it's March 2023 or February 2023, and the Omega variant of yes. coronavirus requires another lockdown to occur in March of 2023, yes. mm -hmm. what this legislation then does is say that that won't require an adjustment of the values in the valuation list to be published thereafter, so we won't have the same problem that we currently have. Because it's already have been discounted? Pardon? Because it's already been taken into account? Well, the economic impacts of COVID will already have been taken into account. Which is the October date? Yes. At, at the antecedent valuation date, yeah. And so that, that is what we're trying to do with the uh, future proofing. What it, it does not say is that because it is very specifically linked back into Article 39A, it is not saying that COVID cannot be taken into account in any adjustment to the valuation list. It has been treated as an economic impact. I'm not sure I'm following you, but... The point I was really trying to make when you um, raised that point was this. Clause 1 is a very dramatic intervention because it really does, as it put to you, upset the balance distorts the, the relationship between the market value and the NAV. Was there not another way of doing it? Could you not have said all the matters in 39A will continue to be taken into account, but you shall measure and evaluate in doing that any financial assistance already given? Um. Sure. Go? Yeah, I, I maybe answer. <laughs> go on ahead, Angela. So, the, the, what, what's actually valued is the, the vacant property. It's the premises that are yes. valued. It's not the business that is valued. And the valuation list is a measure of the market, uh, how the market has um, divided up the, um, the, 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 how the, how the market is um, uh, assesses the value of, of those properties, not the businesses. So the, the relativity of those values is in relation to the market values of those property, not any support that um, businesses in those premises would have taken. It would be it would it would start to create inequalities, and actually, um, it would be um, bringing into the valuation aspect something that was never that, that that's not actually in the rates order in terms of the definition of how the rateable values are arrived at. But you're taking out of the rates order something that is relevant, namely the impact on the physical enjoyment. COVID has a, has a negative impact on the physical enjoyment of the property. Mm -hmm. Hence, the rate value should go down. You're saying, forget about that. We're not taking account of that. We are sustaining the rateable value as if that effect wasn't there. Mm -hmm. So how is that fair to the, those who, who use those properties? 
the, the, the scale of the support that has been put in place for the, the two years, the two years rates holidays, and all the other support that has been put in place is, is how the executive has chosen to support those businesses? Yes. That's why I'm saying, would it not be fairer to say that when you're looking at the adverse impact of COVID on the rateable value, you measure it having regard to the fact that there nonetheless was very important governmental assistance. In other words, you can't, it can't be a win-win. Well, well, in actual fact, the way the rates order is, um, is drafted or, or is there, um, we took legal advice on that um, particular point, whether or not it would be possible to take into account in assessing what the NAVs were. The, the degree and the level of assistance that had been provided in trying to arrive at the uh, net annual value or the rate rental value for the premises. Um, and the legal advice that we had was that we, we would not be able to take that into account because, in effect... Yes, but those, if you provided for it in legislation, those, you could. That's the point. Th those you could have drafted this to allow you to take that into account. I, I would suggest that would have been a fairer approach than the approach you're taking to liquidate entirely an obvious adverse impact uh, as ever informing the NAV. The fairer way to do it was sustain the NAV informed as it is by COVID, but mitigate it by the fact that <coughs> there already has been payment for that. One of, may I? Yeah, one, one of the key tenants of Northern Ireland rates Rating law is that values, properties valued in what we call tone of the list. Yeah. And if you start valuing shops that are subsidised through grant support differently from each other, you've completely displaced tone of the list. And tone is is how the valuation list is created and defended. You can't unpick the tone. You can't have two shops sitting side by side, which are basically the same property, but occupied by different businesses being valued at different levels. Two similar shops sitting side by side will be valued at the same NAV. If one of them happens to get grant support because they're affected worse by a pandemic than another one, you will end up with two NAVs that don't sit together, they're not aligned. You will have displaced tone. And th that's one of the key features of the rates order, the tone of the list feature. We can't displace that. But what does this do to the to the, <coughs> the efficacy of the list? If in fact it's not informed by the greatest possible impact that has come from COVID, what this does is treat COVID as economic, which is correct. This treats COVID as if it never happened. You know, it treats us as, econ as economic because we will take it into account as an economic factor at the next reval, which we're doing now, and it's going to be reflected in the values which are being, which will reflect the rental market at AVD first of October 21. So COVID will be reflected in the next valuation list correctly as an economic matter rather than a physical matter. Could we see the legal advice that told you that? Well, we have the summary of it has been provided. We've already given the summary. Yes, could we see the full legal advice? Well, I don't know about that because that would be uh, was a privilege, legal privilege. privilege. Yeah. Well, privilege is, wa is waivable by the person who asked for the advice we, in yeah, the department. We've been strongly advised not to do that. Oh, I see. Just, only only um, for the reason that they would create a precedent in, in waiving legal privilege. Maybe if could I illustrate what you're suggesting then by reference to some of the kind of cases which have been identified by members of the committee at the previous sessions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, Tesco or Sainsbury's or, or ASDA may approach us and say, um, we have been affected by the coronavirus, or oh. wine Affected, flare, affected or positively in their case. Positively. Yeah. 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 Might have been, but then uh, alternatively, they may well be able to say that we've got additional costs and all kinds of other issues that affect us, or an off-license. Okay? And they may, may approach us, and we, we may, on the basis of the evidence that is supplied, because that's the basis on which all these decisions are taken, decide that there would be a reduction in the NAV. Now, they have received no financial support to date, so in your scheme of approaching this, the fair outcome would be that that kind of rate pair would receive a reduction. By comparison, an estate agent would approach us. I'm sorry, why would they receive a reduction? Because if we had assessed on the basis of the evidence that the NAV ought to be reduced because of the impacts. No, but there was no adverse impact for that. How do you know that? Until you've seen the evidence and you've made that assessment. And there will be 
some smaller properties in town centre locations owned by some of those retailers who would have been affected by it, and then they would be entitled to a reduction. <coughs> On the other hand, if you take a travel agent, for example, Mr Wells has made mm. the point quite forcefully about them. Mm -hmm. um, they would approach us, we would have a look at it and say, yes, there should be a 25% reduction for the sake of argument in the NAV of your property. However, you have received to date this amount of rates for support. You have received these grants, therefore you are getting no reduction on your NAV. That is a potential outcome mm. of the approach mm. that you would adopt. Mm. Now, yes, I appreciate that is the point, that you know, if, if they have got with one hand, they can't get again. But they won't under. But the, the, the tenor of the discussion that so far has been at the committee is that we ought to be helping those types of businesses which have been the worst affected. The outcome of this would be, given the very extensive nature there has been a grant support, um, the fact that every single business to date has received some degree of rate relief, um, four months to date, and may will be five after the, the budget, um, for whenever an additional month is added next year, um, there is virtually no business in Northern Ireland which has not received um, some degree of reduction. And then there are other people who have received no support, that would be utilities, for example, um, uh, and others. Um, so they still are able to challenge us, the, the rail network, for example. Um, has got an NAV, um, Translink would be, would be capable of challenging and coming forward unless they had, we had some kind of way of restricting that because they were a certain type of rate pair. So we have all sorts of things we need to work through, the details of how that would be uh, um, implemented in practice and it would end up in a situation I'm fairly certain it would see none of the classes of business which the committee is concerned to give assistance to actually receiving any help. Mm -hmm. Sure. Unfortunately, I have questions in the house. I have to go okay. to. Okay. Thank you. One, two, three. Sure. Uh, can, I, it? Yeah. Yeah. can I just come in on that point, sir? Yeah. Go ahead. Just for my own self, uh, whenever you. Um, Do you want to make Answer a declaration as a. No. Okay. I have everything moved over. All right. Um, on the, you stated that. I'm thinking on the public house sector. Where you said it was on business, but something somewhere f tells me that turnover, uh, turnover which wasn't on a monopoly in the public house sector, uh, was brought in. Was brought in. That's where you could have had two pubs, one facing the other with a different rateable valuation. Where you stated it was on the commercial basis of the rental. So. So, th so there are, are a couple of there's three different methods of arriving at the net annual value, all of which is essentially a, a, an estimate of the rental value of the property. Mainly, um, properties that are rented, like shops, offices, warehouses, there will be plenty of rental information on which to assess the net annual value on a comparative basis, on the basis of the rental information. There are some types of property that there isn't a ready rental market for them. Um, but there is trading information and turnover information and, and the, the likes of pubs and hotels and petrol filling stations. We would use the turnover to assess what the rental value of the property would be. And then there are other properties which there is neither comparative information because they aren't typically rented or there isn't turnover based information because uh, it's not suitable to arrive at a rental value. And we use um, construction costs, cost of construction that's decapitalised. Uh, to arrive at a rental value, but in all three uh, methods, you're, you're essentially getting to the same thing, which is an estimate of the rental value of the premises. So and they should all, you know, yeah. uh, all things being equal, any of the methods should arrive at the same uh, at the same end point. Yet you, 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 we can't have pubs probably doing the same amount of business across from each other. I'm sorry just to pick up on that, but it's what I sort of I know about your. Uh, both being at two different rateable valuations, that creates an unfair, of course, competition. So that's why I am bringing it up. Uh, I mean, I picked up on whenever you stated that it wasn't because you generalised there that it was all businesses, you know, that you looked upon on the bricks and mortar side, not necessarily on the business. But e even within the monopoly that, that goes out there, even to the corner shop, or, you know, I mean, whenever you look at the turnover of a pub, a lot of pubs have changed and they're into that food type business now. I'm sorry to, to, to go on about this one, Chair, but it's just to, to find out, you know, that's not a monopoly business, that which is turnover on, on dry sales. Do you make any difference in that? Um, so we, we, we look on uh, at um, 
pubs and hotels etc on the basis of the the types of um, business that they are so we have certain pubs that are categorized as wet pubs and then other pubs that are categorized as um, food pubs essentially and we look at the turnover the relative turnover on each of those types of sectors um, and uh, use the information that comes forward in terms of the uh, the breakdown of the turnover to uh, to um, arrive at a rental value for the type of the type of the pub, whether it that, be a wet that pub. That brings or us back, Angela, again to what you were saying earlier and what we spoke about the last time Ian and I were here about collecting the rent and lease information to tell Collect LPS. Do you remember that whenever you asked me about the rent and lease questionnaires yes. when we were here before? That's why we're asking for that information now for the publican to tell us what is your turnover on wet sales, dry sales, are there any other income streams? Because all of that yeah. will inform the rateable value at the next reval because we use that to work out what would the hypothetical tenant pay to rent that pub. And he will look at the income to make his decision on what rent he can afford to pay. So that's why we ask those questions of publicans, hotels, cinemas, B&Bs, caravan sites. You know, what's your income and how will that help the tenant decide here's the rent I can afford to pay? And all that goes towards the next revaluation. That's why yeah. we need people to fill in those forms. Do you remember I sent you the information on the forms? Yes, I do. I'm, I'm just I'm trying to get into yeah. it. It is complicated. Oh, it is? You know, it's very complicated. And I thank you for the evidence that you've given there to me. But I've just one last wee point. Mm -hmm. if just... On the maybe it's maybe now is not the time on the UU EPC the indication of the annual domestic rate plus water and sewage charges in Northern Ireland appeared to be five hundred to nine hundred pound lower than the rest of the United Kingdom. But somewhere along the line I always thought our water charges were within our rates. And is that per how do you base that? Is that per individual or per household based? Um, so this is from the Fiscal the Commission report, is it? Yeah, he came in there. That, but, I mean, Northern Ireland is lower. It's saying here 500 to 900 pounds lower than the rest of the UK. So if it's lower and we're paying our rates on the valuation of our houses, mm -hmm. just on the domestic, I know it's, it, it's brought down there. How, how do you come to that figure that it is lower if, if water rates is within the size of a, or the size of a house or the value of a house? Um, there's, there's no separate water charges in... in Northern Ireland, whereas there are separate water charges in England, Scotland, and Wales. Is that on the house Ian, or is that Sir Mr. Snowden? Is that uh, per house or per individual? Um, uh, it's, it's uh, per house. Per house. Per. It's per house. So um, the figures that we provided is quite difficult to work out what is like a, an exact comparison because you need to take a look at the council tax charge of a particular type of property in England, Scotland, and Wales, and compare it to an equivalent property here. So what we've taken is the median rates bill and the median council tax bill. Um, so um, the figure that's been provided there is half of all the rates bills are lower than that and half are higher than it. Um, equally, the figures for um, England, Scotland and Wales are median council tax um, mm -hmm. figures. So it's quite difficult to pinpoint an average um, uh, an average rates bill or an average council tax bill because property types are, are very different. Um, what you do find, though, is at the top end of rates bills, um, I think the highest rate bill in Northern Ireland on the domestic property is about three thousand six hundred or three thousand seven hundred pounds. Mm -hmm. Is pretty much the same as the highest council tax bill at a band H property in England. Mm -hmm. So um, ours is spread out much more. So in England, they've got eight bands of council tax, where ours ours is based on the value of the property between twenty thousand and four hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. It's a very which we're going out of consultation to look at changing. Yes, the cap. Yeah. The cap. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, if you wanted to, if you wanted to do something with that, it's essentially you would have to change the poundage on the on the rateable value to, to put it up closer to, to England, and that would mean everybody's bills would go up. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Jim, um, I'm sure you do. You've got embedded agents watching everything that happens in this committee, because you even can write us replies before we even send you the letter. So I know you were been watched, and I'm sure you watched <laughs> the. the we were here. <laughs> we were, we're here when you were asking the questions. Ah, but then we met afterwards to discuss what to write to you, and you actually sent us the, the letter yeah. before we actually sent it to you, which is well done. I'm not, I'm not criticising you, but it had never happened in my 27 years in this building. But we'll endeavour to be less efficient in the future. <laughs> so, and it was, I'm sure you listened to the FSB and the Hospitality Ulster and, and the evidence they gave, and actually I thought it was quite responsible. I, I felt that they... They weren't demanding the sun, the moon and the stars. They accepted the high level of support, but they homed it in this £50 million. 
mm -hmm. which seemed to be the, the game changer as far as they're concerned. How did you react to the council saying, as I assumed they said, that they want a slice of that 50 million? Um, well, we were well, we're surprised by that. Um, councils are tax raising organisations. So the rates, part of the rates is the council's tax. Um, so the notion that they ought to be getting relief from the tax that they charge on other people was a little bit confusing to us, um, what the justification mm -hmm. would be. Right, rates, uh, councils like um, central government pay rates on the properties that some of the properties that they occupy, not all of them, but some of them. Um, so um, I don't know that they would be needing to have relief on their own rates. Um, what they have received, I think, is quite a lot of protection from the rates release that we put in place. So essentially what we've done with all the rates release is take away the risk of non-payment. So a business which doesn't have to pay rates pre presents no risk of non-payment. Mm -hmm. And we are paying all of their rates for them from the executive. So councils have been quite substantially protected by that um, during the course of the pandemic for the two years. Um, all of the councils, with the exception of uh, Mid and East Antrim this year, will be generating quite healthy surpluses on their rates. Uh, and Mid and East Antrim, it is connected into one um, one valuation case um, and about the, the valuation of a of an oil terminal um, being changed to non or to industrial, which affects the valuation. But they will compensate for that from the de rating grant. So all of the councils have been quite substantially protected in their non domestic rates revenue over the course of the past two years. They've also received quite a lot of support directly from the Department for Communities and additional COVID related support. Um, so we can't see what the justification or the rationale would be for taking money which has been set aside to provide relief to businesses affected by the pandemic and giving that to an arm of the public sector. So that I think is a no, uh, a very clear no. Um, now, you, may listen to, you listened to the FSB's comment and they said it have spread out over all the businesses £670 per business, which obviously is very thinly spread. Have you given any thought as to how you're going to target that money? Mm. Um, in, the, um, in the budget announcement, um, th they, there was provision for a one-year, oh, one, sorry, one month mm. rates holiday for all businesses. Um, Ian, how much is that going to cost? Um, for one month for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, it's 20, because we're taking out large food stores, I think it's 23 million pounds for the month. Okay. And then two further months for retail, hospitality, tourism and leisure. Uh, and childcare and airports. And childcare and airports. Okay. And the airports. Yeah. Would that include off licences? Oh, off licences, no. No, because they have done extremely well. No, they're excluded from the rates. They're excluded. That's good. They, they, they would be entitled, like all other um, businesses, for the one month. Is there even any logic to that, given the fact that their rateable values must have gone sky high during the pandemic? Right. Well, they, they occupy. Well, uh, no, the, sorry, their rateable values didn't go sky high during the pandemic. They're, even they're though they made a fortune. Their rateable values didn't change. You, you don't put someone's rates up because they happen to do well in the same way you don't put their their value down if they happen to have a bad year. The rateable value is the, the value the of the property, not of the business that occupies the property. So it's the property vacant and to let that you value for rates. Yes. It doesn't matter who's in it. So if someone goes in it and has a really good year, we don't come along and put their rates up. We don't do that. We wait for the next revaluation and then we collect the rents and then the rents will inform the rateable values. Sharon, is it fair to say from the market that you're saying that there hasn't been any sort of appreciable drop in property values at all? The market's always in a state of flux. There's lots of changes going on. Now, it's too early to say what will happen as a result of this reval, but the, the, stu the, the rents that we've collected so far are showing that there's a bit of stability in some sectors, but there's other sectors where rents have increased. And there's other sectors where rents have very clearly dropped. I'm not going to get into what they are because that would be me giving you the results of a revaluation before I actually know them. Yeah. But the market changes all the time. That's why we do regular revaluations. That's why we're rushing this one in, in three years instead of five years to take account of this particular set of circumstances. That, that there may actually be businesses who have who are locked into leases that predate mm -hmm. the impact of COVID and their rent reviews wouldn't be coming up just yet. So it will take a bit of time for the impact um, to, be, to be seen uh, on the rental markets. Um, we're, we're taking the, the rental market as it is at October 21 and the evidence that we had have at that point in time. And obviously new leases at that point in time will give us the best evidence. But it may take a couple of revaluations for all of that information to go through um, into um, 
the, the 2023 and the 2026, the full impact of the pandemic uh, before, it's, before it's fully seen. It might take a couple, maybe even three revaluations. Yeah, but not trying to sort of prejudge the reval that's still going on, Sharon, but is your indication, or sort of, I'll be careful about how I say this, but there hasn't been an indication that there has been a collapse in value? We haven't seen a collapse in value. No. Okay. It's still early days. We're still collecting that information. We we ha we're still sending out reminders to businesses to fill in their rental lease questionnaires. So it's really too early to say at this point in time. Okay, Jim. Yeah, I, I, obviously the idea of a one-month rate holiday is very simple and, and clear-cut. But clearly, some people have got through coronavirus and had a good coronavirus crisis business-wise, and others have been absolutely sent to the wall, yeah. is that not a rather blunt way, rather than looking, I keep harking on about, the two I know about are travel agents and dry cleaners. Mm -hmm. Travel agents, awful, dry cleaners, no functions, no weddings, no dinners, you know, doing no trade worth talking about. They're going to get a one month, and yet a business that might have done jolly well, it's going to get one month as well. Um, well, part of the, the rationale for that is we're, we're removing the right of appeal from every rate pair. As part of uh, on COVID grounds from this this bill, um, so so everybody has had that right removed, and so therefore we need to find some way of compensating all um, all business rates payers as part of that. Um, but then equally at the same time, find a way of targeting those sectors which have been um, affected the most significantly. So that's why we are doing the the dual approach. So you, you, we could have taken out fifty million pounds and spent it on two months rates holiday for everybody. But what we've done instead is one month for everybody, and then a further two months for those sectors which have been, um, on the, on the basis of the Ulster University's analysis, the most severely affected by the pandemic. So it's an attempt to, to balance those two things out. If you get into a much more um, sophisticated targeting approach, it's a very difficult thing to administer um, because the, the boundaries between different types of businesses are not always as clear cut as you might. You might think. And you'll end up in, appeal, in an appeal process like the one that we're in now that mm. we're trying to resolve. Mm. Okay. Ian, is this, obviously this is contingent. We know that the bill has gone through for Royal Assent now. I think we just heard that information earlier on during the committee. So the bill has gone through for Royal Assent. So the £50 million Barnet consequentials come in here anyhow. Yes. However, when we asked the question about the £1.5 billion that was uh, being sent to England Wales, whether that had to be spent you know, within the financial year, that came back and said no, it wasn't. They were looking at measures of sort of spreading that over and the rest of it. Yet we've been told we have to do this because we need to get the 50 million in because we need to spend it in year. Is there any reason why we're having this sort of discrepancy from what's happening in England and Wales and what's happening here? Um, the Barnet consequential comes whenever the English legislation is passed. Um, I think the timing of it is very unfortunate in one sense in that it will come before the January monitoring has been completed um, on, on the current schedule for the English legislation, which means that it will have to be added into the pot of money for allocation at, at January monitoring and be spent in the current financial year. So what the Minister has done is he's carved out the £50 million in next year's budget. So um, effectively, we weren't able to get the carry over into the next financial year, but a decision has been taken in the setting of the budget um, so that the money will be available next year. Sorry. Keith. Okay, thank you. Um, Ian Sharon and I apologise, I was late, I was, had to pop into the chamber for a question. So I'm going to ask a question regarding, and maybe it's covered if it is, you can maybe summarise it. Mm -hmm. The three and a half years trading figures, what years are you ref referring to? And how far does that go forward? So you, are, you, are you finishing on the 1st of October with the half a year and working back, am I correct? Or is it running on further than that? So, so I, I'll maybe answer that. Um, yeah. We've asked for three and a half years of trading figures. Normally, we would ask for three years trading figures where the antecedent valuation date is the 1st of April. Okay. The, the antecedent valuation date is the 1st of October this time, which is um, three and a half years since the previous re, uh, antecedent valuation date. That's why we have asked for three and a half years of trading figures from the previous re, uh, antecedent valuation date, 1st of April 18 to the 1st of October 21. So obviously that's going back from the 1st of October. Yeah. So the, and I, I asked the Minister this in the Chamber and I appreciate the 1st of October, you have to pick a date while the yeah. date is right or wrong. Are you going to see enough of a, you know, a snapshot and is that additional half year 
Why did you just? Why did you do that additional six months? Is that because of the first of October date, first or is that to get a better, call it average, or a fairer method? Maybe is a better way of putting it. Well, the first of October is the antecedent yeah. valuation date, which is the date at which we are yeah. estimating what the rental value of the premises would be. So, what, what we're trying to do is get a feel, uh, get the trend of the of the trading of the particular premises from the last uh, revaluation right through showing the the bottom of the uh, of the um, the curve in terms of the the ability to trade uh, and right up to the antecedent valuation date. So. Um, it, it should show us where the trading would have been prior to um, the co coronavirus or the, co the pandemic coming coming through, uh, and then show us how, how that has been affected, how the pandemic has actually affected uh, the trading of the property. So please, just by way of background, sorry, sorry um, um, England um, and Scotland are also doing revaluations to take effect in 2023. So all of us have faced a choice. Um, so I think England have gone with the 1st of April this year. 21. Yeah, and Scots have gone with the 1st of April 2022. Now, um, we don't think if you take the 1st of April 2022 as a valuation date, there would have been sufficient time for us to get through the logistical exercise of doing the revaluation. So it would have been too difficult. Um, we thought that the 1st of April was in a very difficult situation. We were still in the lockdown. It would have been very yeah. difficult or very little evidence to work on. Um, so we picked one in between. Now, there are problems with all of these dates uh, and there are issues around all of it. Um, but that seemed to be us the, the most, um, the best balance between getting the information in and giving ourselves enough time to actually do the work. Yeah, there's a very practical consideration. It takes about two years to do a revaluation. There's an enormous amount of work to have set the AVD at April next year. We simply wouldn't have had time between then and September in producing the draft values. That, you know, you have to take those considerations into account as well. So, if I've got this correct regarding hospitality in the three and a half years, how much is it weighted the, the footfall? So, let's say you have a, a pub, for example, and the footfall, for argument's sake, is down 50% across those three and a half years. But the rent doesn't change because this lady is referred to, you know, you're in a five year contract or whatever. How much does that weight on that uh, NAV? So, the footfall, for argument's sake, is down 50%. How much is that going to? Reduce that NAV for that basically. If uh -huh. if the rental figure is the same, uh, the um, well for pubs in particular you're, you're talking about. Um, and hospitality, whatever you. Hospitality. Yeah. Well, it, it depends on the uh, on the type of the operation. But let's say it's a pub. What the valuers have got to do is try to establish what a fair maintainable trade would be, um, which is. So, so Mr. Catney ran a pub. Let's say he's a very successful publican. He does very well. If I went into it, I am a less successful businessman. I can make less money out of the same pub as he can. So we've got to find some way of balancing out the, that aspect of you know a good quality operator compared to a, a less successful operator. So they've got to work out this fair maintainable trade. Now, um, Angela and Sharon know far more about this than professional valuers about how that would be done. Um, but effectively, you've got to. Make a judgment. Because you're, you're going to have all this hospitality, and let's say, for argument's sake, they're down 50 percent across the three and a half years. They reckon their NAV is going to come down. They, or you would assume that. Well, okay. Just just following up on what Ian was saying there. Well, this is why we ask for the turnover. We're we'll going over three years. Mm. You're looking for a, a level, a firm, maintainable trade over a three-year period. Some pubs will have a good year, and then there'll be a dip. And some pubs that are just open, they'll have a honeymoon period. Everybody's going there, and they're going to have a brilliant first year. Mm. But that's not fair. That's not maintainable. Mm. So the valuer, the chartered surveyor who values the pubs, will be very experienced in this field, and he will be looking at all of the trade of all of the pubs in the vicinity and looking at. Remember what I said earlier about tone of the list. He'll be looking at the tone, what an average pub could do in that location and that sort of business. And he's not looking at you as an individual trading. He's looking at the hypothetical tenant. Mm -hmm. So the three years trade that we look for is, is to weed out the ups and downs, the peaks and troughs. And the reason why we're going with three and a half years this time is because the AVD has moved, but it's also to take account of that fallow period when the pubs were all closed. Mm -hmm. Now, this is different from any revaluation we've done before in that we are taking account of COVID in the turnover uh, for pubs, hotels, cinemas, those kind of things. It's one other one of the reasons why it takes so long to do a revaluation. There's an awful lot of talking to be done between now and then with the publicans, with Hospitality Ulster, to work out, hopefully, an agreed method, not an agreed method, an agreed uh, scheme of valuation with that sector. 
so that they'll agree to our proposals and to how we're going to value them. We'll engage with them, try to get their agreement, so that whenever we publish the next list, they will be satisfied that we have very fairly taken into account the peaks and troughs over a three and a half year period. And what the rent was before, there's actually very, very little, little rental information available on pubs. I think for the last revaluation, we collected 40 rents. Most of the pubs in Northern Ireland are owned mm -hmm. and occupied by the, the publican. So there, there's not a terrible lot of rental information to go on here, which is why we rely so much on the, the trading, the three and a half years trading information. But the, the period of time we have now, between now and the end of this revaluation, is when we will engage with Hospitality Ulster to try to agree the scheme of how we're reflecting COVID in their next valuation list entries. So previously, just a second, previously we had, I think, reflecting, we had evidence before that there was difficulty of getting um, evidence from the likes of Hospitality Ulster. There is, there is. There, there's, a, there's a reluctance for them to tell us their turnover. You know, it's a very closed job. Um, so we, we, we just try to engage, really, just to say that the more you tell us, the fairer the valuations will be going forward, so that they, they're confident that the new NAVs, when they're published, actually do reflect a hypothetical rent and that they don't feel that maybe that's too high. But th this is the time for them to engage with us, but it really does take uh, interaction both ways. It really does. I, I should maybe say, in fairness, it's not Hospitality Ulster that we're asking to provide us with the oh, sorry, information. Yeah. It is the individual rate payer. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, but there is the trade body. Yeah. yeah. Keith. Okay, so, so we're, look, we're looking back then, obviously, at this, this bill with respect to coronavirus. Is that going to have any effect on the reval? So this hypothetical business we're looking at with the three and a half years, we're looking back over his or her business, and it's down, let's say, for argument's sake, fifty percent because of coronavirus. The reval was to do with NAV back in the previous state. Is it going to have any input on this revaluation exercise at all? It might do. Well, well, well that's what we're doing at the moment. Yeah, we're collecting we're the information now. As I say, it's too early to say what the outcome will be. Yes, but, but, you, but you the, imper the, the, the purpose of the revaluation is to to uh, to take the, the temperature of the market and the um, the trading information that is available at the at the antecedent valuation date. But the bill is only look, looking to the <coughs> NAV, the previous NAV. You're the now twenty twenty. Yes, the you're now revalued for the new NAV. So yeah. coronavirus will be taken into effect. Or footfall, whatever that has caused the, that. The, the impact of the, the of the pandemic on the rental market will be taken into yeah. effect. So it's, it's a distinction, but it's one that needs to be made. Okay, one other question, yeah, may, Chair. Uh, they, you referred to um, 23 million, Ian, for the figure of the one mm -hmm. month. Is that a sort of a compensation mm -hmm. if this bill passes? Clarity, to business. That's what they're saying. Uh, Excuse me a bit. Well, yeah, as in, in sort of response to the fact that the, the right of repeal is being taken away, um, over the three years of this valuation list, starting on the 1st of April 2020 and ending on the 31st of March 2023, then um, all businesses will have received at least five months rates free at the end of that period. So you've got to set that against the fact that we're, we're not going to take COVID impacts and closures related to COVID in the effect whenever we're assessing challenges to, to NAVs. Uh, we think that, roughly speaking, as a percentage, that is about 15 per cent, would compensate everybody more or less for what they, they might expect to see. Uh, some other types of businesses might expect to see a larger reduction in NAV on the back of a COVID changes. They will have had, by the end of this rates package, uh, 27 months out of 36 paying no rates. So whenever you put those things together, we think that then looks like it's, it's a reasonable balance uh, or compromise to take away the, the right of appeal against NAVs. So, so what, one final, final question. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. So what would you say in the businesses now that, let's say, they've had, they've had a two-year rates, no rates to pay, they'll possibly get another three months, okay? But they've been, they've been borrowing money, they've been using whatever savings they have, Reality is going to hit them whenever the rates bill, which uh, plus all the bills, mm -hmm. uh, increasing all the shit, that's not your thing, is going to land in their mat, let's say July, August next year, whenever that is. Reality is going to hit those businesses and they're going to struggle. Or, or let's say they get only the month and footfall may, be, may or may not be down. We don't know that. We don't know what's going to happen in the new year. We just don't know. What would you say to them? Because this is the only sort of avenue you have to breathe with possibly a, an appeal. Burn made us only for let's say eight months. The appeal is going to last until the new revaluation comes out. They're struggling. Um, 
I think the, the, the first point I would make to you, Mr. Buchanan, is I, I don't decide how much rates the business ought to pay. Those decisions are taken by um, by elected representatives, either in district councils or in the assembly and the executive. Um, if um, if it is felt that there ought to be more support, rates support for businesses, then we will administer that. Um, what we've been given is the job of just trying to work out what is the most equitable and efficient and easy to administer way of um, making use of the £50 million pounds that's been granted to us. So um, I think I fully accept that there are, are lots of businesses who will continue to struggle because the, this, the environment is, is difficult. Um, we are always willing to talk to any business about making a payment arrangement to try and spread that burden out and make things as easy as possible for them. Um, but I can, I can only administer what the executive and the assembly give me. Um, so at the minute, I've got 50 million. Mm. Okay. Thanks. Appreciate Thanks. it. Thank you. Uh, Ian, just a couple of ones. Um, so just to get this right, sort of what you're saying is that the COVID economic impact will be taken into account. But the closure periods won't. Um, the COVID economic impact will be taken account of at the next revaluation. Yep. The, we, we think that the impact of the pandemic and the closures is so widespread that it can only properly be dealt with as an economic impact, not as a localised individual property base. That's right. Okay. Got that. Um, the final one. In your written response, you appear to offer a view of the outworking of the bill. To clarify, is the Department offering to amend the bill in order to include a power to suspend the relevant provisions pending mandatory review process with resumption subject to Assembly agreement? Um, so this is in relation to exclusion clauses? Mm -hmm. um, I think that was in relation to whether or not we should have a sunset clause. Yeah. So I think what we were proposing there would be that we would come back at a future date with a proposal to putting something to that effect in, if it was considered to be necessary. Wasn't that what we were to do? Yeah, we were, sent, we we're happy to review it six months, a year, whatever, if, if you want us Some to go back and have a look to see how it worked. Agreed timetable. Hmm. No. Yeah, so you're not going to amend the bill? No. No. Okay, that's it. Okay, dokes. And Matthew hasn't returned, so thank you very much indeed. Ian, Sharon, Angela, thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you very much indeed for coming in. And if I don't see you before, hopefully not, I don't take that the wrong way. Have a really <laughs> happy Christmas and a happy new year. And we will see you in the new year. Do not doubt it. I'm sure. <laughs> okay. You. Cheers. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Give our best to everybody in LPS as well, please. Thank you. Yeah, no, I'll do that soon. Okay, thanks. Okay, Tim, are there any other questions we want to send to the department? Mm, no. Okay. If we're agreed now, we'll move into closed session. Spend members or Do ministers finished? What stage are we at in the assembly? The minister will be back on again, so that's where Mr. Alistair is. He's number five. Uh, we're Most the finance is back on now. Yeah, do you want to go back in, Alicia? No, it's okay. No, I'm all right. I think, I th look, I think. Do you want to go back in, Keith? Philip, are you happy? Stay on. Hello. Okay, let's continue. Hello. Okay, right, going into closed session. Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.